Sure. Okay. <laughs> so uh, now, it, thanks. I'll be able to post the lecture at the end. So, what do I want to cover today? It includes culturing methods. I should talk over here. Uh, I'm having the most problem again. Where are you? Okay, culturing methods. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the different kind of media you can have. There's uh, what's referred to as routine media. And then there's liquid media, solid media. And then there's two special medias I talk about. One is selective media, and the last one is differential media. So this is just how we would grow our microbes, whether it's uh, bacteria or eukarya, this, you have to have a way of growing them. Next part of the lecture, some of the isolation techniques, and this is a very quick portion. There's not a lot to talk about, but um, I'll just kind of give you a picture of what the isolation techniques are. Then there's some counting methods, dilution plate counts, membrane filtration are different ways of isolating your individuals. And then we've got uh, indirect count methods, including tur turbidity and metabolic activity. These are two very standard sort of methods of counting how many bacteria you got or yeast you have is by uh, how cloudy a solution you've got. Because you don't want to always plate and count, which is like the standard, um, but you can just do a standard, make a standard curve, and then base your turbidity of your solution on your standard curve. And then finally, I talk a little bit more about fermented foods. And today I'm talking a little bit about, uh, I think it's just uh, mostly bacteria fermented foods. Okay, so the first thing in uh, the idea of media is there's routine media, Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry, can you skip a slide? Oh, maybe. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, how did that happen? Sorry. <laughs> Thanks for that. Uh, routine media. So routine media is just a generic sort of media for all kinds of organisms. Um, hopefully, lots of different kinds of things can grow on it. Uh, the problem with routine media is not everything can grow on routine media. Um, routine media will supply, like it says, essential nutrients to waters uh, and water to cells. And you use routine media to maintain your cultures. Um, but some cultures have very specific needs and will never grow on routine media. For example, uh, Mycobacterium leprae is uh, the bacteria that causes leprosy. Um, this is a very specific bacteria. And the way I, I, I seem to recall, the only way they can actually kind of grow it in the lab is to <laughs> infect an animal. And uh, I think their animal method is uh, aardvark or armadillo, I think it's armadillo. So they, they take these poor armadillos and they infect them with leprosy uh, to watch the effects of leprosy. So, and to maintain a culture of leprosy. Uh, so you, you can't actually take a plate, streak out leprous, uh, mycobacteria leprae onto a plate. So you have to find a different way to do it. And that's the way they did it. Um, so some organisms, are very specific and they really have high, uh, very, very special needs. Um, now there's this idea that some cultures are complex and some are defined. I'll just write these two words out, complex. When we say something is a complex media, what we're saying is, it's like soup in uh, like, like last week, 
I decided what I would do is make a chicken broth. So I took some soup, uh, so some uh, chicken bones, added it to a pressure cooker, cooked it down to, uh, well, cooked it for about an hour. Then my, we had soup for supper for a couple of days. You would think that that is a very complex media because there's bones, there's the marrow, there's all of the complicated, and there's an onion, carrot. So it's a real complicated mix of just everything. Um, when we're talking about a complex media, oftentimes these are referred to as enzyme digests. And um, if you see something like uh, an A's in it, <laughs> uh, usually enzymes end in the letters ASE. Then you know it's a complex media that you're making. Um, enzyme digests and actual, what am I trying to say here? Oh, maybe it'll come to me in just a second. Let's do chemically defined or complex or defined. With defined media, it's more which vitamin is in it, which salt is in it, which sulfate, how much of a phosphate. So it's always usually chemicals and chemical names. So there's the idea of complex and defined media. Uh, media always has to be sterile, not sterilized before you being used. Um, and like I was saying earlier, not everything can uh, grow on routine media. Okay. If the bacteria exist on some body parts, or like, or, or, or like on some body fluid, in some body fluid, yeah. in the body fluid not, can this serve as a culture? Yeah. For the, 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 you can use that as a culture. Is that what you're asking? Yes. So you can inoculate another culture with that, with, with the dilution of oh no, but, but if you take, take the body to out of the body can you control bacteria in it like in your line or like this is an ongoing uh, uh the question is can you use bodily fluids to grow your organisms and this is an ongoing uh, area of research i know people who want to study cystic fibrosis they take uh lung material and they attempt to grow bacteria in the fluids from their lungs or um, people with kidney dialysis diseases they take the like you say the spent urine uh, and they try and grow organisms in that as well so they that that's active like people are doing that it's a good idea people are doing it very complex it's, what's what's in the body like, I don't know how it's done in the hospital setting, but like, if you want to do urine analysis and you take out urine from somebody, like, how do they culture the bacteria? Do they make it in the fluid or do they have to put it in another fluid to cause it? Um, there's like standard biochemical ways where somebody would take the culture from someone and then they would go to the shelf, make all the reagents and then do all the biochemical tests. And because technician time is expensive, they've gone to automating that process. And what they do is they'll take the urine sample and put it into a, a very elaborate culturing machine and in an hour or so the culturing machine will tell you what organisms it suspects are in there an hour maybe two hours i, I don't know exactly what the um 
length of time is if you want. Uh, how do you spell biomiru? A U X. I think that's the name of one of the companies that has a, that machine. That uh, you can just add the a complicated sample, and it can be from the environment, it can be from people or animals, and it'll tell you, like, give you a spit out a result of what it thinks it is based on its biochemical tests. That would be used if your culture is still within the person with the bodily fluid. And so he's asking if you took the bodily fluid out and you wanted to then culture part of that fluid inside of the body, right? Can you do that? Oh, yeah, you can do that, but you have to figure out a way of doing it. So you have to have a special um, culturing system. So you could have a, because the internal systems are different than what you would experience in a lab, you would have something that would model it. So it would like be like a digester for the stomach. So you'd have a model of a stomach or lungs, you would have a model of a lungs. And uh, it would, you could take that, like we'd put it into a, this system that would move the liquid around and uh, inoculate that. So yeah, you can inoc inoculate your fluids too. But it's complicated. You have to build a real big system for it. <clears throat> Okay, uh, next question or next slide. Routine culture, uh, routine media. Um, you've got sources of carbon, nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus, sodium. Uh, you have different sort of essential nutrients for microbes. And then there's also trace elements. You have a little bit of uh, minerals of some sort whether it's iron, copper, molybdenum, zinc. And sometimes you can also add vitamins, vitamin B12, vitamin. You can actually uh, specify exactly which vitamins you add to. When you're making a routine culture, you're also adding RO water. There's the idea of, uh, there's a difference between solid and liquid media. Solid media is media that has agar on it and uh, liquid media is a broth. So it, it looks like a yellowish, tannish colored broth. Um, we have all actually colors of uh, material that we can grow organisms in uh, based on what we put into the growth material. Um, like I was saying, agar is the most common solidifying agent. And here's another picture of uh, Fanny Hess. Fanny, you remember, she's the one who came up with the idea of using agar. And uh, remember the story, she was asked at uh, Robert Cox lab how to improve the plates that they had. They were using Petri dishes uh, developed by Dr. Petri and they're using gelatin and gelatin when you heat it up and it gets wobbly, liquidy, especially if you heat it at a of 37 degrees. So you can't really uh, maintain culture that requires high temperatures. But you can maintain cultures you know, up to 55 degrees or so for a week with uh, agar. As long as you maintain the moisture in this plates. Okay, so here's a picture of agar I got off the web. The first picture is in French, uh, it's agar agar, and you can see that it's a dessert, raspberry dessert. There's also these little packets you can go to the um, markets, the Asian markets, and buy agar in a pure form, and you can add that to your recipes as well. So if you want chocolate agar, raspberry agar, any flavor you can kind of think agar, you can make it. They sell them, uh, I don't know if it's like uh, $2 for a little small bag, something like that. Um, I've got some at home. I usually bring them when I remember, but I forgot. Uh, today, um, 
one of the notes about agar is you bring it up to a boil, you add your agar, and then it solidifies around 40 degrees Celsius. As you can see there. So what you do when you're pouring the agar media is you heat it up, take it out of the autoclave. After you got it out of the autoclave, um, you do what's referred to as the grandmother's rule. Grandmother's rule is you don't feed the baby milk that's boiling hot. You test the temperature by the inside of your arm and then feed the baby milk. So once it's capable of being tested or touched, then you can pour it. So this is kind of a lab rule. Uh, if you can touch the bottle, you can pour it. If you pour the media too hot, you can melt the plates or cause too much condensation on the top. If there's too much condensation, that condensation has to get, you have to get rid of it somehow. Okay, so here's the idea of uh, chemically defined media and complex media again. So chemically defined media is media from pure compounds. So you have always chemical names, sodium chloride, potassium phosphate. Uh, what do I have here? Dextrose, potassium dibasic, dibasic phosphate, potassium monobasic phosphate, citric acid, vitamins. So all of those are chemicals. You can get those in chemical forms. Then there's the idea of complex media. These complex media have the uh, extracts. So they, I, I call it soupy. It's, it's not referred to as soupy. It's, <laughs> uh, but, but to me, it's soupy. Um, when it comes out of the autoclave, people say, oh my God, uh, like uh, smells like soup. Yeah, that could be deep heart infusion. Uh, brain heart infusion. So it can be an actual soup of stuff. Um, so you have things like extracts. Something called peptone, which is just all of the proteins digested. Yeast extract. You guys, uh, are you familiar with uh, the Australian yeast extract food? Mm -hmm. well, like, yeah. Like, so it's it's a yeast extract. You just take the stuff and put it over your toast. It's um, something that. Disgusting. <laughs> uh, Worse it depends if you're Australian, I think, or New Zealand. They, they enjoy this food. Uh, but I still think that depends on the person. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I haven't met anybody from Australia who's, who swears by it, but I've heard of it. My sister went, and she said she couldn't find a single person there that even enjoyed it. Oh, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> oh, so it, it could be the media kind of hyping it to... <laughs> I think it was one of those foods that they pushed more as a nutritional type supplement that is good for you instead of eating necessarily the whole foods that you should. And that's yeah. where it became popular. Um, later on in the lecture, I'll also talk about single cell proteins and uh, we'll, we'll talk about those kind of foods too. Um, I have here things like, here's some names. Nutrient agar. Nutrient agar is a complex media. Potato dextrose agar. You take potatoes, dry them up. So it's like potatoes with agar. Uh, one called Luria bertani agar. This one is used for growing Estrichia coli. Sabor dextrose agar used for uh, growing yeast. So we have different kinds of agar for growing different kinds of organisms. And they're complex, and we do call them uh, routine media too sometimes, especially the LB and the PDA. Depends on the lab you're in, sometimes, anyway. So, selective media. There's this idea that you have media that grows everything, but what happens if you only want a certain kind of organism? Well, this is referred to as selective media. Selective media. What it does is it suppresses 
unwanted microbes. And it uses a, diff a number of different ways of doing this. Uh, one way is adding in inhibitory substances. So inhibitory substances can be anything like a dye, a metal, a salt, antibiotics, or even pH, any of those ways that can be, uh, they can get selective. So here's a media I found online. You don't have to know all of these details. Maybe know that there is a way of finding out if you have a bacillus serious A, a bacillus serious infection. Uh, what is bacillus serious? Bacillus serious is a bacteria. Why is it important? It causes really nasty diarrhea and vomiting. Um, and it can be sourced on cooked rice. So if you leave your rice out too long, you can get a bacillus serious infection. Yeah, question. On the counter overnight. Uh, so what do I say here? Um, incubation period is anywhere from 30 minutes to six hours. So the longer you leave your rice out of a fridge, the more chance it has of growing. So if you keep it warm for six hours on the counter, you know, it's, it could be a problem. You could get, if it's uh, already got some of these bacteria. So what's the point of this? It, I want to show you, there's a selective media where it's really bright and green. If you have your vomit sample or your stool sample and you've isolated bacteria from that, you can see that, yes, this person has a bacillus serious infection. Uh, was it say that gram positive rod shaped facultative anaerobic bacteria belongs to bacillus genus? So it's like a gram positive rod. And like I was saying, if you store the food at room temperature or above for a long period of time, it can. In, uh, anyway, so that was. An example of a selective media. There's a enrichment media as well. If you have enrichment media that's in broth form, that's referred to as enrichment media. So if you put it in a plate, that's your selective media. If you take this bacillus seria media and you put it into a broth instead of on an agar plate, you can get lots and lots of bacillus seria bacteria. So that's a way of getting way more of that organism is by enriching it, giving it an environment it loves to grow in. Okay. Um, here's one at the bottom, tetrathionate broth for salmonella. So they can have a you can have a broth called tetrathionate broth. That's for enriching salmonella. Here's a, an example of a tetrathionate broth picture. And you can see number one's the control. That's the broth, just the broth. Number two, salmonella typhi. Uh, look what it's done to the color of the media. It's turned it from this green color into a neon color. So from teal to neon, same thing with this Salmonella tetraetitis and Salmonella tetanurium. They're all neon green. And the last one, Staph aureus, it's still cyan or still kind of greenish. So the Staphylococcus don't turn this media neon but the salmonella do. So this is a good way to tell if you have a salmonella infection is just by using this kind of broth. Okay. It's a very uh, lovely color too. Like you can obviously tell one from the other, especially if you have a control. Good question. Does that, no? Okay, so there's questions there. 
uh, differential media is another idea. So um, there's complex media, there's selective media, and now there's differential media. Differential media, you can grow in or um, you can grow two different organisms on differential media, and they grow and show a difference. So it's not so much to eliminate other organisms, it's to allow multiple organisms to survive, but you want to be able to tell the difference between the two. So uh, what does it say here? Supports the growth of various organisms. It allows different organisms to be visually distinguished. They look different. Great. So you can use all kinds of stuff. You can use different dyes, different pH. Uh, what's an example at the end? Lactose broth with phenol red. Okay, so here we have an agar called Maconchi agar. You can grow lots of different kinds of bacteria with it. Um, and the difference here is going to be between your lactose fermenting colonies. Well, I should show spotlight here. Lactose fermenting colonies are pink, but if it's not fermenting, like it doesn't break down lactose, then they're colorless. So this agar um, may start off reddish, but then uh, and, and turn pink with the fermentation. But if there's no fermentation, it stays colorless. What happens when these organisms break down the lactose in the media is there's a pH change and the pH change, you know, it's like chemistry. You get a pH change uh, with your indicator, the indicator changes color. So whether you're doing, what are some indicators? Phenothaline, uh, litmus. So there's lots of different indicators that you can use. Um, here's another example. Here's a media that's both selective and differential. And we do get to do one plate like this later on in the semester. Uh, here's a plate. When you get it, it's a pink plate. You take your bacteria, you spread it out like butter on the plate. And you wait a week. Next week, you come back. You see there's a line of growth. This line of growth for one bacteria, uh, I have MOB here, I don't know what that is. So let's say maybe S3 E. coli or something like that, maybe some bacillus is grown on this plate against Staph aureus. In this case, Staph aureus turns a vibrant green after a week of growth. So the Staph aureus has this ability to um, metabolize mannitol salt. And when it does that, the phenol in the media has a reaction and changes color. So you have a really wild color change with the uh, mannitol salt. There's some really wild colors. Uh, here's one, we have seen methylene blue. We use this as well. and um i think this is often used with clostridia okay so that's uh selective media um i can't see what the title of the slide is because of the zoom stuff thank you <laughs> so how do we isolate pure stuff um well first of all you have to sterilize your media next topic there is the autoclave. If everybody here, has someone here not been to the lab yet? You haven't been to the lab yet? No, I haven't made it there yet, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, I lost last week. 
Okay. But I know where I'm going now, so I'll, okay. to, I'll be there tomorrow. Okay. Good. <laughs> Good. Uh, with the autoclave, this is a big machine in the corner of the room, and it's kind of noisy. It's a pressure cooker. What it does is you put your media in there, the pressure cooks it to 121 degrees Celsius for 15 pounds of square pressure. PSI, 15 PSI. I think that's 100, just over 100 kilopascals. And then the 250 Fahrenheit. Uh, I don't know why we always say 15 PSI and never say the thing in uh, Pascals, but it's always given as Pascals. Anyway, it kills the microbes. Um, <laughs> that's the point there. The reason it kills the microbes is it not only gets to a high temperature, but it holds it at the high temperature, high pressure, so everything is killed. And it's that length of time that is killing the spores as bacteria. Um, the more complex your soup is, like let's say it's soil, you have to hold it much longer because the heat has to penetrate right to the center, right? So uh, it might not be a 20 minute stay. It might be like an hour long stay if it's something that complicated. I used to make uh, oatmeal media and the oatmeal media was so dense, um, we would sterilize it, pour it out into agar plates. It often got contaminated. So we would have to extend the cooking time not to just 40 minutes, but maybe like a 80 minute cooking time. And it took forever to make, but uh, eventually we figured out how long it took. There's also something called membrane filtration, which you can run your media through, and this will pick up the bacteria. This is frequently used when you're making uh, defined media, because what you'll do is you'll make your glucose solution, and then you'll run the glucose through a filter. That'll pick up the bacteria. Usually they use a 0.2 micron filter when you're doing this kind of work. Oops. Okay, so uh, questions. Danielle, Sebastian, Amanda, Will, Amy, three, four guys, ladies, men, gang folks. Uh, question number one, what is selective media? Tell me what selective media is. Is uh, media that needs to pick up uh, certain things that they're looking for X and inhibit everything other than X that you're looking for. Uh, example, I, I gave one example. <laughs> There's this, this uh, the one for race, uh, Bacillus serious. Okay, uh, next question, what's agar? Go ahead. Um, it's a carbon isolated bacteria, and it's used in the development of the certain health that certain people. Thank you. And third question, how is selective media different than differential media? Go ahead, Paul. Oh. I think that's right. No? Amanda? No, differential media allows you to grow pretty much everything, but it has different colors associated with different microbes as they're growing. Uh, were you saying selective media will or? Oh, oh. The question is the difference between the two because it doesn't hurt. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you both got the question. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's say you're given two solutions. One's called Luria broth. Uh, this is used um, for growing Escherichia coli. So here it says these are the ingredients you need 0.01% sodium chloride, 0.2% or sorry, 2% tryptone, and dextrose. And dextrose is your sugar. Uh, and two milligrams per liter vitamin B. Is this 
complex? It's kind of a tough question. Or chemically defined? Yes, go ahead. This is Luria bra. This is Luria bra. Is it given the two untangled Luria bra? It's a complex one. You're right. That's all coming together. It is complex. Uh, you were given two bra solutions Luria bra oh, and a dextrose bra. Mm -hmm. Which was to be considered, which is complex. I, I read it wrong. I thought everything was one thing. Okay, so Luria bra, one thing. What did you say? I said, I'm saying the Luria bra is the complex one, which is a complex one. Good. And the dextrose bra? It's not complex because it's your complex. Dextrose and vitamin B. Yeah. Good job. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. The complex one is. Luria broth is complex because it has triptone. So uh, triptone is a enzyme like peptone. It's a tryptomatic digestion. It's like a peptide digestion of proteins. Also has sodium chloride. Yeah, sodium chloride is a chemical. So there are chemicals in there, but there's also these mixes. Okay. Ah, <laughs> good, good to observe that. So there's uh, chemicals and mixes as well. Okay, here we have uh, tetrothionate broth. So look at the ingredients of tetrothionate broth, sodium thiosulfate. Thirty grams sodium sodium thiosulfate, calcium carbonate, ten grams. Pancreatic digestion of casein, peptic digestion of animal tissue, and bile salts. So, what do you guys think? Yeah, exactly. It's a complex media because uh, it's not chemically pure, it's got these digests in it. Okay, so that's part A of the lecture uh, culturing methods. Next, I'm going to talk about. The isolation techniques, so you got your street plate and pour plate. Two very quick demonstrations. So a street plate. In the lab, you will be given an opportunity to do this. The idea is you want to obtain pure individuals. So you'll be given a liquid and we'll ask you to isolate individual colony, well, we'll ask you to make it isolated individual colonies from that. So what you do is, if you see me from here, So um, you take the inoculating loop. You've seen this last week if you're in lab. And what you do is you sterilize the inoculating loop, dip that into your liquid, and then you take an agar plate with media and you streak out some lines. Next step, sterilize the loop. Go back to your plate, streak out. So this is the first step. Second step, streak out some lines. Third step, sterilize the loop, streak out some lines. And then there's a fourth step, same thing, sterilize the loop, streak out the lines. So you're just drawing back and forth. Yes, go ahead. You're only giving it in interest for a data filter filter the one time. The first time, so this will have the spreading that quickly. Yeah. It's like it's like a dilution sort of effect. Yes. And so how long were you keeping the loop in the plane in between? Oh, steps? till it gets red. Okay. I was gonna hold hold this Well, you hold it in the flame, let the wire get red, and then carry, uh, let it cool and then carry on. You don't if it, it makes a it sound like like it's cooking something. You you know you've gone, cooked it. 
cook your bacteria, created aerosols. So the first line will be kind of thick. And you can see that on this plate picture. The second line will be less thick. The third line might have individuals, but the fourth area should have separated individuals. So what you're doing is kind of moving them along and spreading them out. Okay, so what do I say here? Pick up a sample using sterile loop, spread the culture on the quarter of the plate, flame the loop. Uh, this is all a technique. Um, you only get to learn to do it by doing it. <laughs> Saying how it's done is one thing, but uh, actually doing it is, is the only way you'll actually really figure it out because the agar is kind of soft. It, it's not like butter, but, but it has a softness to it. So running the loop over it, you can make a real mess if you push too hard. Uh, so you wanna be kind of gentle and just kind of spread it over across. Um, and it, I say repeat for four parts of the culture. Uh, some people do five sectors, some people do six, just depends on your technique. Okay, but standard is for, for pretty much everyone. Um, every time you go, you get fewer cells and you can use both non-selective or selective media. Then there's a pour plate. This is another technique. So with a pour plate, I should just use the little. Is this big enough for you guys? Nobody's complained yet. There. So with the pour plate, you get an entry petri dish, and you actually pour some of your culture in there. So maybe one mil, maybe 0.1 mil. Not too much, just a little bit. You put some of your culture in there, and then you add your liquid media, pour the liquid media in, swirl it around, get those microbes kind of into the whole media, and then you let it sit for a week, and then you count all the dots inside of the media. So there's the street plate. and four plate methods. Uh, after reading week, we get to do this, I think. We're not going to see tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> tomorrow it's gram staining. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so questions. Why do we want to isolate Microbial colonies, and I'll leave this. Okay, you guys have answered the questions. Uh, anybody in class can answer. Steve Johnson. Excellent. Yeah, you want to count them. That's one reason. So you want to figure how much you have. Go ahead. Yeah, you want to, you want to try and isolate your bacteria. And what we do, it's an exercise. We give you uh, a mixed media. And we ask you to isolate colonies from mixed media. Yeah. So you want to isolate the individuals, like one culture from a different culture. That's the point. Uh, someone described the streak plate to me. Like, how do you go about doing it? Go ahead, anybody. Oh, Natalie, I didn't. Uh, did I have you down? No. No, uh, you answered questions from me last week. Last week. Yeah, you're okay. Uh, so uh, um, I was worried that I missed you for questions this week. Street plate, go ahead. Um, if you're inoculating with an liquid, uh, um, sanitize the loop, dip it in your liquid, start with um, a set of streaks on the top or a section of the plate. Yep. Or more. Yep. That's the way to go about doing it. Thanks. Uh, 
Someone describe pork plate for me. Sanitized petri dish at your base substrate, then add a little bit of your inoculum, let it sit in culture, and then count. Yeah. Okay, so you see two petri dishes with microbial growth. Plate A has colonies all only on the surface. Plate B has colonies within the media. Okay, so which techniques were really used for the two? Yeah, exactly. Uh, some microbes, for, uh, when they grow, they uh, release gas as well. So if you pour, use a pour plate with a microbe that releases gas, you'll see bubbles, big bubbles in the media from the microbes fermenting. Okay, so uh, we have two more topics here. One, direct count, and second, indirect count. With direct count, you're counting individual microbes. You see the bacteria, you count the bacteria. Uh, this is done a different couple of different ways. One is dilution plate count, another is membrane filtration. The picture I showed you at the very beginning of the lecture where I have four different dilutions, that's like a direct count where you can actually go onto a petri dish and actually kind of count the number of colonies you get. Uh, well, I say it's direct count. That's a direct count of colonies. It's colony forming units, not actual bacteria. I didn't talk about that yet, did I? Colony forming units versus colonies. That's something coming up, okay. Uh, what are indirect counts? Indirect counts, you measure indirectly and kind of infer how many bacteria there are by some measure. So uh, the most common one is turbidity. If you use light to shine through your culture and you can find out how turbid the culture is. So if based on how turbid it is, if it's more turbid, more bacteria, less turbid, less yeast, okay? Okay, so there's also viable versus total counts. Viable counts only count living organisms. Um, you have dilution plate counts, membrane filtration for this. And then you also have total counts. Total counts count everything, living and dead. Um, for living cells, for viable counts, you can use a dilution plate. Uh, you can also use membrane filtration. What you do is you run bacteria through the membrane filtration, then you grow whatever's on the membrane. And that will tell you how many living bacteria are there. Here's a standard test question. <laughs> um, so for the next test, I'll ask you to identify the parts of this graph. This is a growth curve for a microbe. With microbes, typically when you're measuring how much they're growing, there's a phase there called the lag phase. So um, the lag phase is a time of growth when it's not exponentially growing visibly. If you count it by number, it's uh, it looks like a fairly straight level line. And then there's a period where it's undergoing exponential growth. And that's a really steep part of the graph. And then there's a phase that's stationary and it just kind of survives. And then there's a death or a decline phase. So there's four phases here, lag phase, log phase, stationary phase, and death phase. Um, if you plot this on log paper or as a logarithmic graph, the log phase is not so clear, but there is a definite change between the log phase and the exponential phase. Like it is slower growing at the beginning. There's a technique called dilution plate count. And this is done by serial dilutions. And the serial dilution is 
you have your media um, set out so many containers and put a one in 10 or one in 100 amount into your first set of media, then one in 100, one in 100, one in 100, and you plate that out to find out how many organisms there are. This is a standard kind of math question. I'll give you an assignment next week with this kind of question on it. Every dilution decreases the concentration. And what you do is you plate a bit of a volume and that'll tell you how many there are in the original. We'll take a look at the picture here. So we have, I don't draw the bottle. All right. These slides come to me from another instructor. So they, they haven't drawn the bottle. <laughs> uh, but in the original bottle, that's the standard sample you'd take from. And what they've done is they've taken, say, one milliliter, put it into nine milliliters. So they get a one in 10 dilution. Next, do the same thing again, one mil into 10 mils, one mil into nine mil. Yeah, that's how come it's uh, going from one in 10 to one in a hundred, to one in a thousand, 10,000, 100,000. And it's also based on these uh, exponents, 10 to the minus one, 10 to the minus two, 10 to the minus three, 10 to the minus four, 10 to the minus five. That's the dilution rate. So you can see here, the first plate, it's really crowded. You can't count those. Uh, it's too concentrated. Second plate, well, it's still too crowded. You can't count those. Third plate, aha, there's enough individuals that are isolated, you can count those. So we call this first two plates, uh, there's a standard kind of lab abbreviation, too numerous to count, TNTC. And then you'd count these two plates that have enough to count. The plate that has three, you'd still count that. If the plate has zero on it, um, you might say too few to count because there might be organisms in the media, but you didn't capture them, okay? What does it say at the bottom? Calculation, number of colonies on the plate times reciprocal of the dilution sample equals the number of bacteria. We'll go over a calculation next week. Okay, so here's the two methods. Uh, on the left, you got the pour plate method, pour some in, swirl it around, throw your colonies, next you come back and count them. Spread plate method, you have agar, you take some of the same stuff from your stock, pour out 0.1 mil, and you use uh, a spreader. And this spreader, it's like a glass rod bent. Uh, Oftentimes we just call it a hockey stick. <laughs> I, I don't know why. It looks like a hockey stick, maybe. It's just what we say. When, um, what you do is you sterilize the glass rod in ethanol, dip it into ethanol, pass it through a flame. You'll see a little flame come off the glass rod. When the flame's done, you can go in and spread the bacteria on the or yeast on the plate. Colonies grow only on the surface of media. Yeah, so in both cases, uh, you'll have a count of your uh, organisms. In the pour plate method, you can use one mil or 0.1 mil, um, and you'll explain the concentration based on that volume. The volume here has to be it taken into account when you're uh, doing the dilution as well. Okay. And here's another slide. This slide shows you, so you take the CFUs, 
CFUs are the colony forming units. So in the third plate, I have here 54. So 54 times one over the volume, one over the volume is one divided by, is it 10 times one over the, oh, one mil. Yeah. I'll have to go over the math here again, one over the dilution. And the dilution is this number here. So, um, whoops, the 10 to the minus four, if you put one divided by a fraction, it becomes a big number. So these numbers are typically 10 to the five, 10 to the six, 10 to the eight, fairly large numbers. Does that make sense? One divided by 10 to the minus one, so one over 0 0.1, one over, uh, this is a fraction, one tenth. So if it's 10 to the minus five, it will be 10 with five zeros. Um, I'm just gonna carry on, not gonna show you all the math in this step. Here's a member membrane filtration. What you do is you take your sample, pass it through a membrane, and then you grow the membrane. So here's someone's E. coli probably, uh, they've grown these individual cells and they have taken a scanning electron microscopy for something that looks like a porous region. Uh, and you can see that there's pores and there's bacteria that don't get through the pores. And that can give you a count because every single one of these spots is based on a colony forming unit. That's one method of counting, here's a direct microscope count. What you do is uh, you can use these very special slides. They're hematometer slides. They're used to count blood cells in hospitals um, and we can use them to count microbes as well. So what you do is you would grow your microbes and just put a spot of your concentrated or diluted material into one of these glass slides. And these glass slides are really special in that they've been micro plane to have a really small grid and the small grid magnifiable and you can count the individual cells in these grids and you multiply that by the size um, to actually count them uh, this is done with an maximum magnification so it's like a thousand time magnification. I think I said everything I wanted to say about that. Okay, there's questions here. What is a direct count when describing microbes? Direct count, go ahead. Uh, sorry, I don't remember your name. Pardon? Okay, sorry, this one. Uh, what is a direct count? Wait. And what's a viable count? Good. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Uh, <laughs> What filters are required for performing direct count? What's the filter? Yes? The membrane filter. Right, membrane filter, 0.2 micron. That's, uh, I'm not gonna get you to describe the hematometer um, or describe the serial dilution. We'll talk about that next week. Okay. Is a it's this glass slide oh. that has the micro, like, like it's got manufactured lines in it. And based on the grid, you can count the number of 
microbes in that grid. Okay, so the next step is indirect count methods. And I know I've got something about, uh, I have something here about metabolic activity. I'm not gonna talk too much about that. I'll talk more about the turbidity. So with turbidity, you can have a line based on how many cells you have. So let's say you count your colony forming units you compare that with your absorbance in a spec. So here's a spectrophotometer. So the spec, you shine light through your sample and it reads how much absorbance occurs. And based on the absorbance, uh, you relate that with the number of colony forming units there are. And you can say, okay, well, here's an unknown sample and just use one of these equations, y is equal to mx plus b, and solve for the unknown. So you'd solve your unknown concentration. Is that clear? Have you guys done this before? Have you have you guys used a spec? How many of you have used a spec? Okay. <laughs> so just recently. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we use the same kind of instrument. Uh, here's another one you can measure. Uh, what kind of lab was it? Ah, did you find any? Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do you know what the source of the nitrates in most hot dogs is? Um, in regular hot dogs, it's. it's, it's uh, Artificial and the celery Yeah, celery extract is what they're using a lot now. Uh, here's a slide of kombucha. Someone's got a really big, massive uh, cellulose plug from their kombucha or mother, if you want to call it a mother. Uh, so they're just lifting the mother out of the Media. <laughs> some people think it's gross. Some people think, wow, it's cool. It's perspective. Cool. It's slimy and uh, it's a hydrogel, so it's very absorbent. If you dry it down to like a paper thin piece of cellulose, it's cellulose, uh, you'll see that it's a hydrogel, meaning if you put it back in water, it'll just absorb water really, really nicely. Uh, I have examples of kombucha, but I can't get them because the university's off limits to me right now, on account of the lockdown. Um, I know where there are samples of cellulose. I, I worked in a cellulose forming lab before the pandemic, <laughs> uh, yeah. So I was growing bacteria and making these pellicle plugs and measuring the amount of pellicle there is in the solution. So it's just a, um, are you measuring the amount of sugar used by the microbes to make cellulose or something like that? And you can actually measure the weight or you can measure the amount of, what else is here? Carbon dioxide given off. Here's another graph, carbon dioxide given off. And that tells you that the microbes are living. Okay, so I'm gonna skip these questions and talk about fermented foods really quickly. So there are some fermented foods out there that use bacteria and there's sauerkraut, yogurt, kombucha, vinegar, sauerkraut, uh, there's four major species of organisms that make sauerkraut. You can just take cabbage, shred it up, put it into brine. You get these four organisms. Uh, let me just read it out. Leuconostoc, mesenteroides, lactobacillus brevis, pediococcus, 
pentosaceous lactobacillus plantarum. Uh, I know the Lucas doc is the most talked about one. That's the one that's the sauerkraut organism. Uh, there's a YouTube video here. They're making sauerkraut. Uh, if you want to stay at the end, I'll show you the video. Okay. Uh, yeah, we did that last semester. <laughs> this is industrial sauerkraut. Oops. Uh, here's another industrial sauerkraut making. So I, I included videos. You can watch them at home or up in the class. Uh, yogurt. Yogurt relies on two organisms, typically the uh, Lactobacillus bulgaricus and Streptococcus thermophilus. I don't know if you remember these two organisms from a previous class. Uh, they, they, I think I put them in lecture three. So, but I tried to talk about them in lecture four. We ran out of time, lecture three. Lactobacillus bulgaricus. This is an interesting one. It's uh, obtained by a doctor, Eli Mechnikov. Um, he came up with this idea that if you use this bacteria to ferment milk, like he came uh, up with it from Eastern Europe, from Bulgaria. So these people, he thought, had a longer life and you avoid senility by drinking this this drink that's for the milk fermented with lactobacillus vulgaricus. Uh, we have it as yogurt now. <laughs> so uh, a whole line of probiotic research kind of starts off with this guy here, where in 1905, he describes this organism. Um, there's also Streptococcus thermophilus. And thermophilus found in 1919 in Denmark again in milk. So you heat milk up, Streptococcus thermophilus will survive at around 50 degrees, so you can't kill it. So what you're doing is you're enriching the media for that bacteria. So you, and then you let it grow. Uh, and here's an example of yogurt formation. Kombucha, um, and here's a couple of videos on kombucha formation. Kombucha being like tea, and you add some liquid or solid from a previous fermentation, and you ferment your material for a week or so. We'll be doing that closer to break. It's just a, a fun, I find it a fun lab. And then there's the idea of vinegar. Vinegar, uh, you recall, it's a Cetobacter aceti. The Cetobacter aceti is the, you guys remember who found it? The famous microbiologist who found uh, a Cetobacter aceti. Who was the first guy to, yeah, it was Louis Pasteur. <laughs> That's a good guess. <laughs> yeah. Louis Pasteur found a Cetobacter <laughs> um, One of the reasons his, in, uh, his work was really important is he showed that vinegar is not formed by a chemical reaction. And that was a big deal because uh, French vineyards, they had this wine and sometimes it would, go, it would spoil and they'd be like, what happened? Like, Oh, it must be the chemicals inside. So chemists were involved. Louis Pasteur was a chemist. And he said, oh, actually, no, it's not a chemical. It's this organism that's responsible. So they have this organism called Acetobacter aceti, and he studied it, and it forms vinegar. That's what we use for industrial vinegar formation. Okay, and there's uh, different kinds of fermenters, uh, all kinds of stuff being formed. I want to just get through this. Sorry, there's stuff here. Uh, I wanted to share the idea of single cell protein. This is a new kind of a food idea where you have um, the microbial protein from one organism, kind of like Vegemite. 
kind of like the Australian spread. The kind of yes. <laughs> uh, it's concentrated bread flavor. <laughs> I don't know, concentrated yeast. Fermented, yeah, it's fermented as well. Uh, so there's advantages to having single cell protein, uh, high protein content, uses lots of different kinds of sources of carbon, including methanol, molasses, waste. You don't need much land, but you, it is kind of expensive to grow. You have to have like clean media. Anyway, um, so there are lots of bacteria in it and it has a high protein content, which could be a problem with your urine. And some people are allergic to such things. Um, here are some organisms that are used for a single cell protein. Spirulina, chlorella, and I just name a whole bunch of them. So if you want something with a lot of carbon dioxide, that's what you use. If you want something with alkanes, you use sacro, Copsis lipolytica. You don't have to know these names. I'm just sharing them with you that there's all these things that you can use. Here's some examples. Uh, mushrooms. Mushrooms are small organisms or fungi. Uh, and they what they can do is produce a pure food that way. Uh, there's peculo, um, uses a fungus from wood waste, wood processing, and that's used in animal feed. There's something called protein. Protein uses methanol and chlorine as a carbon source and as a CI carbon source. What's CI? I, I typed it out. I don't remember what a CI carbon source is. Sorry. Uh, this is used for feed protein for animals. And then there's something called corn. It's using a fungal mycelia. So you can buy these products. These are single cell products for, uh, for food. And then there's this acronym I wanted to show you that's applied to it, GRAS, generally regarded as safe. So if you have these organisms, they're regarded as safe. Um, the Organisms don't need testing if you culture it under acceptable conditions. So subtilis, bacillus subtilis, lactobacillus bulgaricus, leuconostoc, gonius. Uh, so the organism responsible for, like I said, yogurt or sauerkraut, they're acceptable. Then there's yeast. There's different kinds of yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, candida, utilis. Yes? Activia, is that a uh, yogurt? Yeah. Okay. Which organism is it? Um, I don't know. It's one of, it's one of the, I'll have to pull it up, but oh. I'll, you'll see it because I missed it. Okay. Maybe lactobacillus of some sort. Huh. I find that interesting. Okay, so there's that. Uh, there's lots of acetic acid bacteria out there. Uh, Gluconobacter, Gluconoacetobacter. They're often found in kombucha. Okay, uh, this is it. First, there's a picture of a SETI. I'm just going through these slides, sorry. Really, really quickly. Welcome back. Okay, <laughs> I said I wanted to finish class early. So I just wanted to finish right there. Uh, now I know Adam was online. Is anybody else, was someone else online? But do you guys have any questions? Um, if you want, you could leave now, or if you want, you could stick around and watch the videos. I've got these sauerkraut videos, kombucha videos. Um, so if you want, you're, <laughs> please, it's, oh, it's okay. 
I, um, that's it for lecture. Good luck with the test. Okay, so I'll just end the lecture there and just show the you guys the uh, videos. End and lecture. More. Stop recording.